to my channel or welcome back. This week is Birth Trauma Awareness Week from September 7th to September 13th. Birth Trauma Awareness Week is usually July 7th to July 14th, but this year due to COVID it has changed. And if you're a first time parent and watching this, maybe this isn't the best video to watch because it's incredibly traumatic. I'm talking about sexual assault, traumatic birth, and just ob obstetric violence, so please skip this video if these things might be unsettling to you. I don't want you to prepare for a birth like this. I just want to educate people about birth like this, and I just want other people who have experienced birth like this to know that they're not alone. I'll pop up a direct definition of birth trauma like right here somewhere. And this year's theme, according to birthtraumaassociation.org, focused on people's journeys through the after effects of birth trauma. It says, the path to healing both physically and mentally, coming to terms with a rocky journey into motherhood, parenthood, navigating relationship changes, partner int intimacy, baby bonding, etc., finding justice and closure, which I think is the hardest thing that anyone can do. All of those things are really hard. I'm going to react to my video and I'll also kind of weigh in on my journey and where it's led me and where I'm at right now with my birth experience and life in general. I made this basically two years ago in September, so we're getting there. This was a few months after my home birth. My story starts when I was 17 years old. I took three tests. All of them were positive. I knew I didn't want medicine and I think that that's as much as I knew about birth was that some people take medicine, some people don't. Uh, so I was young and really uneducated. So in this video I start off by telling you my age. I was 17 when I found out that I was pregnant. Uh, it was in an Arby's bathroom. And then I go on to talk about not being educated and being very fearful about birth. All that I knew about birth was that I wanted it to be all natural because I didn't like medicine. But I didn't know that you would have to jump through hoops to get that sort of all natural birth that you wanted, which shouldn't be the case in childbirth. I feel that anyone should be able to say what they want in childbirth. I feel that doctors should just already go into birth, understand and consent fully. Evidence-based birth education is very important to anyone giving birth, especially teenagers. That's why I've been speaking a lot on my teen experience because I didn't realize how unworthy society thinks teenagers are of education and support in things like pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. Things are crucial and I'm trying really hard to not look back at my birth and regret everything because I can't change the past. I can only move forward and this is how I'm moving forward. In this video I go over what should have been red flags to me during my pregnancy, what should have made me switch providers but I never did. So red flag number one was anorexia. I suffered with eating disorder for many years before I got pregnant. started when I was in middle school and began to starve myself. Previous to middle school, I was on a form of chemo and I was on heavy steroids for my arthritis. I was born with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and had a lot of health issues. Along with that, including uveitis, which has affected my eyes now as an adult. And the combination of medication that I was on made me super sick, but also made me gain weight. I just want my own kids to be happy and healthy at the end of the day, and I don't want them to be 10 and 11 years old beginning to starve themselves because they don't look like everyone else. I remember being a child and my mom holding up a skirt. I was 10 years old and it was after I was diagnosed with obesity, and she had gastric bypass surgery years before that. And she told me, wow, like, your clothes are big on me. I also grew up just being called fat, not at school. I didn't realize that at the time because I was a kid. But I, I believe that's why I began to starve myself. My weight became like the conversation topic at every appointment. At the beginning of my pregnancy, I thought that it was important to let my provider know that I had an eating disorder and it was undiagnosed. I wanted a referral, I think to a mental health professional rather than my obstetrician trying to act like he specialized in my dietary needs and being a mental health professional because he was most definitely neither of those things. A lot of people say that he was a great surgeon. He definitely had zero bedside manner. Knowing that I had anorexic tendencies and him knowing that eating three meals a day was a struggle in the beginning. He still commented on my weight. We all gain weight differently in pregnancy. No pregnancy is the same. Every pregnancy is different. Do not compare your pregnancy or weight or size to anyone else. Weight 
shouldn't have been a topic of discussion at every single appointment to the point to where I was put on a diet and was asked to keep a food journal. I had no health problems during my pregnancy, which I mentioned in this video. I didn't have gestational diabetes. I didn't have high blood pressure or anything like that. And I was eating what I could eat, especially in the beginning when I was extremely nauseous. I was taking in whatever nutrients I could because I was so worried that I would go back to starving myself. With morning sickness and all that, it's easy to skip meals. And I was like, I can't do that. I have to eat. I have to be healthy with whatever I can put in my body that's good enough because I want my baby healthy. So the joking about my weight like sounds funny. I mean like it sounds like a joke. Like how many cheeseburgers have you had today? Well if you haven't had cheeseburgers then what kind of soda are you drinking? Like he was just being an asshole. And like who says that to a pregnant person first of all? Your provider saying these things to you. Something's wrong there. You know I should have switched providers then. That's my number one regret always is that I should have switched providers as soon as I understood the first red flag. But again, I didn't see these red flags until years after I gave birth. Like in the moment, I was like, you know, that's messed up. But then at the same time, I was like, every provider is going to be like this. Well, why switch? I should have switched. So please, go with your gut. If no one else thinks that your provider is an asshole and other people are saying that your provider is just the greatest and the best, don't listen to them. If they're making you uncomfortable in any way, switch. You can fire your provider. You do not have to stay with them throughout your entire pregnancy. I don't care if you just got established there or if you're 38 weeks along, you can switch. There are places that will take you and work with you and hopefully will treat you the way that you deserve to be treated. I did try to prepare for childbirth and I went to a childbirth like Lamaze class at the health department and it was free so that's why I went to it but it mostly just freaked me out. I didn't learn anything important about childbirth. I learned about the process which was great. It was awesome to see a live birth but it was like from the 70s or 80s so it didn't feel really relevant to now. Different things that they would do now because I feel like things are kind of always changing, but maybe not. Like really, when you think of it, it's gotten better in some ways, but in some ways the system doesn't support birthing people the way that it should. I went to Lamaze once and I got a birth plan and I felt like a real adult because I was like 18. I just wrote out something that I thought would be a magical experience that I was really excited and proud of. And I gave it to my obstetrician and he smiles at me and as he smiles, he balls up my birth plan and throws it in the trash. And he says, you won't be needing this. So that is a huge red flag number two. I was afraid to switch care providers at 30 weeks. So I continued to see him and I was terrified for my birth because of that. I was already terrified to give birth. No one told me, which I wish someone would have, to switch providers whenever they acted like that. It should have shown me that my birth wasn't mine to begin with. That my birth was in his hands completely and that he called the shots which is not how it should be it felt like birth was just something that happened to you these are your options and they were taken away what really upsets me is i say that i felt like a real adult because i just turned 18 and i was pregnant and i felt like i felt old and grown and this is something i'd always wanted was to just be grown up or whatever, I don't know. I'm proud of myself for writing this birth plan, for writing down everything that I wanted, like low lights and all this stuff. If I have my birth plan here, I'll read it to you if I can find it. And for him to take all that hard work and to throw it away, it was devastating. And at the same time, I was so scared of birth, I had to look up some of this stuff, which made me more scared. I don't know why Google was so scary. No, something was so scary about childbirth education. I call my obstetrician, they tell me to come in, they check me. I'm like one centimeter dilated. And he's like, you're not in labor. I'm already progressing, I'm already not wanting food. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, I can't go to the hospital. I won't be admitted. So I did what my body told me to do. So I cleaned nonstop all day at home. I rested as much as I could. I just went with the day. But in my head and my mind, I was freaking out. I was like, I can't go to the hospital. You know, what am I gonna do? Where am I gonna have this baby? So I, I didn't wanna try and be admitted. And the day that labor started, it was 7 a.m. on New Year's Eve. I knew that it was birth. In the video, I talk about how I felt like I was getting my period. I had like mild period cramps just before they get super bad. You know what I'm talking about if you have a bad period? 
And yeah, I was like, I haven't felt like this my entire pregnancy. This is not Braxton Hicks. It's not just my belly contracting a little bit. This is it. This is labor. So I called my provider as soon as they opened at 8 a.m. They saw me and my whole family came in with me. I didn't say this in the video, but my whole family comes and everyone gets their hopes up and my hopes up. I kind of wanted this to be more private, but it wasn't. I definitely didn't want an induction and I'll get to that. He checks my cervix and he's like, you're not in labor. If you try to be admitted tonight, I will not admit you. I'll send you home. Like, I can't try to be admitted. What am I gonna do? But I knew that it was labor. I knew it was labor. And my dad was there at my appointment and my whole family was, like I said, and my dad was like, induction for her and my OB was like, I'll schedule the induction and it'll be like next Monday before we can do it. I was like, I don't want an induction though. And he was like, well, if you go over this week you're gonna have to have one. I felt like there were no options there and I still felt like a kid in the sense that my dad was at my appointment <laughs> where I got my cervix checked and was like we need to schedule an induction for her and that's just my dad. He wasn't being a bad parent. He was trying to be a good parent which I respect and understand but at the same time I was having my own child and I know that it could be hard when your baby is having a baby and she is your youngest. I understand all that. I wish that I would have set better boundaries with my family and my birth and I wish that I would have understood that better. So if you're watching this video and preparing for childbirth, oh my god, I'm, I'm so sorry you're watching a traumatic birth video. Please don't think that every birth is like this, but at the same time realize that you don't have to have your entire family there if you don't want them there, especially if you're young and they're treating you like this. It's okay to acknowledge it and to set boundaries with your family and be like, you know what, I'm pregnant, I'm going to make the decision, and you're going to have to, you know, accept that. I had maybe 10 family members in and out of my parents house all day that day watching me labor and scream and clean and it was really uncomfortable to be watched like that. I know everyone was excited and I'm not trying to throw my family under the bus because I believe that they all loved me and loved my baby that I was carrying and they just wanted to be supportive but I just wanted to be alone because I was so scared and again I felt the pressure of everyone needing me to have that baby while they were there. I also felt the pressure of my OB telling me not to come to the hospital and me being in labor. Everything was unfolding just as it was supposed to but I didn't know that. 8 to 10 p.m. I tried to be admitted for the first time. They checked me, sent me home. Second time, checked me, sent me home. Third time, Finally, they admitted me. I signed in. I remember how embarrassing it was signing in. I would scream. Finally, they wheel me up to my room. They check me. Like, I, I didn't want to be checked at all. I was uncomfortable with it because I've dealt with sexual assault. And I didn't know anything about your cervix not being a crystal ball then. I just didn't want to be touched unnecessarily by strangers. I was really uncomfortable with that and I felt violated every time it happened. They put some kind of medicine in my IV. I didn't want medicine at all. And I remember this panicky feeling of being drugged. It brought back triggering thoughts of my sexual assault. I panicked until I instantly fell asleep because the pain medicine I guess is what they gave me. I have no idea. I woke up uh, needing my cervix checked again. Finally that night turned into the next day. And I'm nearing that 31 hour mark where it's time for my baby to enter the world. So later that night, we picked up, that's when the screaming started. And this is when I would become re-traumatized from sexual assaults previous to this. I didn't explain this in depth in my video, but I didn't realize how sexual assaults could come up during childbirth and I would like to do more research on this and have a better understanding of it for myself and for others when I support them through their pregnancy, childbirth, or whatever, especially teenagers because I feel like we don't support teenagers enough and we don't listen to teenagers enough when they're assaulted. I didn't think that ever, ever, I never thought in labor or active labor my sexual assaults would come up in my head and it would feel exactly as if it was happening all over again times 10. Every cervical check I would say no please stop please stop it hurts and I would cry and of course they had to because I had to be checked to be admitted which shouldn't be true I don't think that that should be the rule of thumb I think that it should go by intensity 
consistency and all of those different things of labor. And I shouldn't have gone so early, but my parents were watching me literally scream in my bedroom over and over. No one understood what was wrong with me, and what was wrong was I felt like I was being sexually assaulted again. Get my epidural at 30 hours in labor. For maybe 20 minutes after the epidural, it's starting to work. I feel my body opening up. I feel like I have to poop, I feel like I have to pee, I feel like everything's opening. So I was like, I think I need to push. You know, I was going with what I was feeling and I told the nurses that and they're like, no, 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 wait for the doctor. You know, how can you hold your baby in and wait for the doctor? I'm not waiting for anyone. And he comes in, I'm ready to push and he didn't give birth on the first push because he was counting. That's not how it works. Birth doesn't go how your care provider wants it, going as fast as he wanted, I guess. And he was like, you're not doing it right. You can't do this, just stop. He hadn't been there the whole 31 hours of my labor, just nurses and my family had been. He just gets there and he's telling me that I can't do this and I'm not doing it right and to stop. So he leaves the room for maybe five minutes, push for 15 minutes total. He was there for maybe a minute and then left, left for five minutes. He comes in just in time to give me an unnecessary episiotomy. Cut me down to my butt and uh, I had 22 stitches. And he told me that. He didn't ask, he just did it. He grabbed the scissors and did it. He rushed that baby out. So we did the episiotomy and he said, you have 22 stitches now. And my baby was placed on my chest for a second. And then she was taken off. She was bathed of her verna, which I wanted rubbed in. Her cord was clipped immediately. It still has a lot of blood going through it that she didn't get. And if they read my birth plan, they would have known. That's one of the red flags too. You know, there's nothing that I could have done at that point. But I wish, like, postpartum I could have looked back to all this and be like, oh, it's starting to make sense. I have postpartum depression and anxiety. I have PTSD, but I didn't. They didn't give me my baby, and I didn't get to nurse until about an hour and a half. They didn't get to do skin to skin, no delayed cord clamping, no immediate breastfeeding. It wasn't the natural birth that I wanted or asked for. Honestly, I remember explaining this childbirth experience. It felt like I was being ripped apart by horses running in different directions. You know, like in the medieval times, they would tie people up and their body would be ripped apart as like torture. That's what it felt like to me. It felt like I was being violated and tied down. Because I had all these monitors on that I didn't want and my nurses said that I couldn't pee or get up to use the bathroom because it was too hard to help me use the bathroom. It was too hard to get my monitors off and on and help me take my IV to the bathroom with me. They told me to hold it and it honestly, I just decided to check out. My brain was trying to protect me from what I was experiencing and I no longer felt safe. I shared that everything was happening without my consent. Everything that I didn't want to happen was happening. You know, this is where expectations of birth versus reality comes in. Sometimes we plan so much for this perfect birth and then everything changes. I would be induced and I would get the epidural and I was given pain medicine without consent. I was also given nausea medicine, which I consented to and was okay with but the pain medicine made me feel like I was being assaulted even more because it took away my sense of being and I, I don't take medicine because it feels like I'm being assaulted and I'm afraid to be in that headspace where I lose complete control and they did it without my consent and put it in my IV. I just didn't want to be touched unnecessarily by strangers because again, it feels like you're being assaulted. Especially when you say no and no one listens to you and they say doctor's orders. It makes it feel like everyone's assaulting you and everyone's compliant to this in the room. And whenever you take consent away like that and say no, they should listen. They didn't. So then yeah, they induced me and I didn't want to be induced because my sister and other people said, you know, it makes labor a little harder and more painful. And I wasn't down with that. I already felt like I was in the most pain I could ever possibly be in. Mentally, physically, emotionally, all of it. So I would go to labor for 16 more hours in the hospital being treated like this. I get in the wheelchair to be wheeled out to the car to leave the hospital and I'm having like detachment issues with my baby. You know, from the moment she was finally given to me to nurse, I was thinking in my head, what do I do with this baby? So I get home and I'm dizzy. 
I can't eat, I have no appetite, all I can do is cry. Google it and it's like baby blues. And I think, okay, so that's what I have. A few months pass, I still have detachment issues with my baby. Like who is this baby? It's hard for me to hold her and be close to her. It's hard for her for me to let her nurse. I felt like this was crazy. Like I'm not supposed to feel this way. I'm supposed to be a mom and I'm supposed to be a good mom and I'm supposed to keep it together for my baby. After he stitched me up, congratulated me on my stitches, my baby was placed on my chest for about a second, but then she was taken, washed, Vernex completely washed off with soap not like I wanted it to happen. I knew some about Vernix. I wanted it rubbed in and I wanted her on my chest and breastfeed him for the first hour or two completely undisturbed. But that did not happen because my birth plan was thrown away. I think that it's society has taught us that childbirth just happens to you like I believed it to happen before I gave birth and no one checks on the parents after they give birth. So I was sent home after enduring a traumatic birth where I would completely feel not in my body for about three years. So to answer both trauma associations questions and just reflecting on my journey through my traumatic birth experience, my path to healing both physically and mentally, I started to accept that something was wrong about three years after having a child and tell people that I didn't feel okay. And I accepted help when it was brought to me, when I was going through a breakup with my partner and dealing with things within our relationship, I accepted help and counseling. And I think that acceptance in my journey has been very helpful to me beginning to heal. So coming to terms with a rocky journey into motherhood, I've just come to terms with the fact that it does not take six months for you to heal after childbirth. And I had a positive and healing birth experience after my traumatic one in 2018. And I accepted that then. I also accepted that I'm not perfect and being a good mom is asking for help. So I came to terms with motherhood in that way. Navigating relationship changes, partner intimacy, baby bonding, etc. This is something I'm working on still. It's really difficult to be a single parent, it's really difficult to have a partner and navigate things together. It's all really hard and I've learned to reach out for therapy for relationship issues, whether it's co-parenting or being in a relationship together. The goal for me is never marriage, it's never staying together for the kids, it's doing what's best for both of us and being healthy as a unit, as parents together. Rather than just focusing on us, I want to do what's best for us, yes, but also I want to think about my kids' mental health and their futures as well. Finding justice and closure. I don't think that I'll ever find justice or closure. I don't think that I'll ever find justice or closure. I can write stuff down as much as I want. I can share my story as much as I want and maybe the weight will be lifted for that time being, which gets me by, but I don't think that it'll ever be lifted. But I have found a lot of healing in helping people and doing videos like this and sharing my experience and I did a birth trauma conference last year which I'm pretty proud of but also feel like I wasn't qualified for and I did not do the best job I could have done. I feel like I kind of failed at it but I'm proud of myself for putting myself out there. I'm just not good at leading people and organizing things and all that jazz. That's that and that's my story and I'm sorry if this video was really sad and depressing. I'm 100% okay. I have a therapist. I have help. Please don't be afraid of being a bad mom if you need to reach out for help. I promise you that that does not make you a bad parent or mom or dad or person. The best that we can do is our best at parenting. No one is perfect. I'll leave helpful links below in the description. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you'd like and I'll see you next time.